So let's take a look at a worked example, and we're going to focus on looking at inrush. And in this particular case, I've got a situation where I'm going to be energizing a transformer, and the transformer has the characteristics as shown. And so instead of having a BH curve, basically what I have in this case is sort of like a BI curve, if you want to think about it this way. And for your homework, you'll do something similar, but you'll have a, some, a different format for the for the data but this basically have I have a, a flux density versus current relationship so we're told in this particular case is we're told that we've got this re, um, this relationship and the normal flux density when this thing's operating in steady state uh, you can think about this is a, like your rated voltage uh, is going to be 0.8 Teslas, all right? So for 0.8 Tesla, this is what we're going to um, have as, I guess, the, the normal operating point. And um, prior to energizing this particular transformer, what we're going to have is we're going to have a flux density of, of 0.1 Tesla. And so based on how the transformer has operated before, then what we're going to have in this case is we're going to have this residual value that we're going to have to work with as well. So if I'm energizing this transformer, I'm going to figure out what's the worst case peak in rush current. And we'll go ahead and sketch what's going to happen during the first half cycle of the voltage to see how this current's going to change. So if I go to um, work this out, what I'm going to be doing is going back to the same relationships that I had in the theory part. I'm going to have to change them a little bit because of the way I have the data set up. But basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with Faraday's relationship, B is equal to N d phi dt. Um, phi is going to be flux density times the cross-sectional area. It keeps jumping out of the pen mode for some reason. So um, phi is going to be uh, B times A. And then if I make that substitution, then the voltage is going to be N times A times the derivative of B with respect to time. And so I'm getting this in terms of B because that's kind of how, how I have my data set up. And so the integral relationship between voltage and B is such that B is equal to 1 over NA times the integral of E dt plus plus this initial residual flux density. Now, if I'm told that under normal conditions I'm going to have 0.8 Teslas for my magnitude and my flux density, I, I need to have some sort of way of relating that to my normal voltage, right? And so one way we can do something like this, instead of writing these relationships between voltage and flux density and the time domain, I can also write those in the phasor domain as well for steady state. An integral in the time domain corresponds to multiplying by 1 over j omega in steady state using phasors. A derivative corresponds to multiplying by j omega. So if I have this relationship where B is going to be the integral of voltage in steady state as far as phasor analysis for steady state, I know that B is 1 over Na times 1 over J omega times E. So in steady state, then E is going to be J omega times Na times B. And since I'm working with phasor, they put the little tilde over there. So why am I doing this? Well, I want to relate this 0.8 Tesla nominal value to E. So if my nominal value under normal operation in steady state is 0 0.8, if I multiply by omega times n times the cross-sectional area, this gives me E nominal. I can use this. I can make use of this relationship. So um, in steady state, um, if E is equal to E nominal times cosine omega t plus theta, and I'm using cosine in this case uh, kind of intentionally so you're not memorizing the, you know, the way I'm doing the formulas, and trying to apply that all the time. You have to kind of adapt a little bit. Um, so if this if theta is a point in wave, then the form of this voltage forcing function 
can also um, factor into what I have for the the steady state flux density, which is going to be 0.8. And so E is going to be Na times omega times 0.8 times cosine omega t plus theta. And then what I can do is I could take this relationship for E, I could substitute into this integral expression. And what this does is it gives me kind of the, the general time domain form for B, which is 1 over Na times this integral where when I take the integral that kicks out a 1 over omega, the integral of a cosine um, goes into a sine, and then I'm evaluating from 0 to t. And so in, in the arguments here in square brackets, I have sine omega t plus theta minus sine theta. All right. So what I'm going to have for um, my answer is b is going to be 0.8 times sine omega t plus theta minus sine theta in brackets times uh, 0.1. Let me just jump to this cursor here because this is not cooperating with me today. All right. So what's, what's kind of interesting about this, if you think about what this represents, is this first part is actually the steady state part. Um, the transit portion of this is going to be this part here and actually going to be this part here. And once I get in the steady state, this transit portion is going to damp out. Since I don't have any damping in here, it, it, we don't see any way of it damping, but um, that's what's actually going to happen in the real circuit. Now, what's going to be the worst case value? I've got a positive residual value here. And so I'm going to be looking for a case where this first term here is going to be positive. The maximum value I could make this first term is when these two sine terms become add up to 2. Right? And that's going to happen when I make sine theta a minus 1. And so if I set theta equal to 3 pi over 2, which is the same as theta minus 9 degrees, then this, when time's equal to 0, um, I'm sorry, when time's equal to omega t minus when time is omega t equal to pi, which is when uh, time is equal to pi over omega, that's when this particular term is going to get maximized. It's, it's maximized after one half cycle. And so when omega t is equal to um, pi, when theta is equal to minus 9 degrees, um, that's going to correspond to this, this term in brackets having a peak value of 2. And so the peak value of B is going to be 0.8 times 1 plus 1, which is 2, obviously. I add that to the 0.1, and we're going to have a peak value of 1.7 Teslas uh, associated with this energization. Now, what I need to do in order to map that back to a current is I got to go back to this curve. And so in this case, I just happen to have a value that it corresponds to a point on my table and that's going to correspond to 19 amps. Now what would have happened if I had another value? Let's say I had a value like 1.69. What I'd have to do is I'd have to do interpolation between the two points. I would use a linear interpolation to pick off what that value of current would be. So anyway, um, I'm going to have a peak value of current of 19 amps. Now if I'm doing my energization and I basically want to figure out what this looks like, how do I do this? Well, what I do is I basically go back to this formula for B and I just basically advance time in, in different steps, right? So I would maybe have a step of, uh, I don't know, 1 16th of, of um, that first half of a cycle. And then what I would do for each value of B, I would just simply go back to this curve and pick up the current, right? And so I can I could write a little MATLAB routine to do something like that. So what this would look like in MATLAB is something like this. Um, I've got my 
time step set up in this particular case. Um, basically, I'm looking at delta t being my time step. I've got, um, I'm setting this up where basically I'm just going to plot through the first half cycle. I figure out what time is. I figure out what the equivalent voltage source is going to be. I figure out what value of B I, I'm going to have. And then what I do is I basically go to that curve and then pick out what's the corresponding value of current. And what I'm doing in here basically is I'm, I'm looking at if I'm on the first segment, the second segment, the third segment, the fourth segment of that curve. And if I'm at a value in between, what I'm doing is I'm doing linear interpolation. So basically this is a, like a piecewise fit of the, of the saturation curve. But basically every time I calculate a value of B, I'm pulling off the, the equivalent value for the current. And so what you end up with is you end up with a plot that looks something like this. Um, this is the voltage right here at the bottom. Maybe the scaling's not the best, but, but anyway, you can see I'm going through one half cycle of the voltage. I'm energizing at a, a zero crossing in this case. Basically, this initial current starts out really low. But then what happens is it really jumps up as I get into the saturation point of the curve and then eventually hits this really high value um, that you can see right here. And then what's going to happen as I go forward in time after this, then this current is just going to kind of drop back off again. And then basically this is going to kind of oscillate um, between zero and this peak value of 19 amps because I don't have any damping in this particular circuit. But what we're more interested in looking at right here is what's happening during this first cycle and we see it's actually going to be peaking at like 19 amps and so I say I'll have a homework problem where you guys do something kind of similar to this um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this sort of a data right here in a different format and then see if you can replicate this also in PSCAD.